providing it in 2016 in the rise during the rise of Trump. And uh, the book had probably been gestating most of my life, but this was sort of a, a pushback against historical amnesia for me. And um, I keep thinking of Voltaire's words, here we are in 2022, that those who can <clears throat> be manipulated to believe anything can be manipulated to do anything. And I think of Faulkner's words, the past is never dead, it's not even past. So these, these are sort of with me as, as I go through the book tonight. Um, and I think the outlines of the story are familiar to most people following Pearl Harbor, uh, some 120,000 uh, men, women, and children of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast, and most of them were American citizens, uh, were imprisoned without due process. And those living on Bainbridge Island were the first to go. In 1988, the government apologized and made reparations, very, very modest reparations, I should say. So the opening piece I'm going to read is titled Saturday, December 6, 1941, Bainbridge Island, Washington. Um, and it's dedicated to Michael Anton Stitch, who is the grandfather of Mary Nelson, who I dedicated the book to. And Mary was a close friend of my mother's since childhood. They both passed away and they show up later in subsequent pages. Is that Sean by chance? Yeah, this is Shan. Hi. Oh, good. Oh, good to see you. You too. So this is Pearl Harbor Eve. Dusk darkens the waters seal smooth skin. The old Croatian farmer, a strong man, a strong nave of a man built for storms, rose out upon Eagle Harbor to touch flame to wick in the harbor light that guides the ferries in. With Mandarin calm, the first stars come into their own. Eight miles across the water, Seattle's mo modest glow reddens a filament of cloud where a freight train passes along the waterfront with a faint lathe-like thrum. Wick lit, he admires the first festal lights shining from the cottages scattered around the harbor. He crosses himself as always, dips his oars back into the sound of water and rows for home. There he will have his own wine to drink, garnet, as arterial blood, and break his wife's warm bread to christen the season of lights. South, above Eagledale's dark firs, a star spills from the wayside of eternity. This next piece is called Remembrance, December 7th, 1941. And it's taken, it's inspired by the uh, oral histories on the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community website. I did not want to quote directly. Uh, so I, I paraphrased and poeticized their words. I wanted a consistent tone throughout the book so that they serve as kind of a Greek chorus or voices from a Japanese no play to punctuate the narrative but their voices are there. Remembrance, December 7th, 1941. Monumental events, <clears throat> unlike the little things, come at us sideways. A cod belly gray Sunday with Christmas vacation only two weeks away. Out riding her bike with a friend, she heard people talking about a war. That is how most people first learned about Pearl Harbor, a glimmer, a hint, She'd never heard of the place. Confused, she rode home and told her siblings about the talk of war. They switched on the radio. That afternoon and evening, the radio streamed nothing but bad news as Japan advanced in the Far East. The next day was school, a day in which the US Congress would declare war on Japan. She felt anxious, but the teacher told the class that Japanese Americans were Americans. They had nothing to do with the war. 
Still, she felt nervous. As the days passed, her anxiety subsided. For now, the boundary stones of the thinkable stayed put. Well, for the, in the last six years, we've seen the boundary stones of the sinkable set in motion and they're still moving. This next installment is called We Hours. This is no time to mince words. So wrote the weekly newspaper publisher, Walt Woodward, Woodward in the wee hours after the date which would live in infamy. Through the cold, dark morning, Walt and his wife, Millie, prepared a one-page, single-sided special edition of the Bainbridge Review. There are on this island some 300 members of 50 families whose blood ties lie with the nation which yesterday committed an atrocity against all that is decent. After the cat's paw came the right cross. I am positive every Japanese family on the island has an intense loyalty for the United States of America and stands ready to defend it. Already up and down the West Coast, hatred stirred in its larval sac and Walt and Millie Woodward stepped out upon their lonely road together. I wanted to pause here for a second. For, for those of you who don't know me, I, I spent my career as a community newspaper publisher and the Woodwards are one of the reasons I got into the business. They were North Stars when I was growing up on Bainbridge. Um, but this is an extraordinary moment. You think about in the, cold dark hours of December 8th and the world has lost its head and the Woodward's kept theirs. And it reminds me of the lines of Theodore Rethke, uh, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. And they were one of the few voices in the media on the West Coast to speak out and protest what was coming. Uh, and it's at this moment that they laid the seedbed, seedbed for future reconciliation after the war. Because after the war, more people returned from the camps to Bainbridge Island to their homes than to other places on the West Coast. So it's ex extraordinary what they did. They were new owners and they had shallow pockets. They could have lost everything. And the flip side of the coin, the press, this is the epigraph. <clears throat> I think it probable that if Seattle ever does get bombed, you will see some University of Washington sweaters on the boys doing the bombing. Edward R. Merrill. War dines upon our inner dearth. And so a whirligig of furies took to the cankered hoof. Even Edward R. Merrill journalism's patron saint, knelt as footstool stool for the perennial id to mount the pale horse that leaps our well-trimmed hedges unto ashen pastures, where the fisted heart pumps sulfurous wine and little children mutter obscenities. This too is an entry from the Book of Earth. From FDR's pen, the star wheel turned on February 19th, FDR signed Executive Order 9066, creating exclusion zones for the West Coast. The boundaries would be defined on March 2nd. And it was very clear very soon that the um, people of Japanese ancestry living on the coast were targeted. And a subsequent line from an editorial that Walt Woodward wrote is this, there are many heart sick people on the island today, the review and those who think as it does has lost. And on March 24th, uh, soldiers in their World War I tin pot helmets showed up on the island. Uh, they'd taken the ferry from Seattle and they posted around the island, executive civilian exclusion order number one, which instructed all Japanese living on Bainbridge Island that they must be gone before noon, March 30th. Of course, the army would take care of the logistics. And as I wrote at the end of the paragraph, um, 
as they posted these notes on uh, telephone poles, heralded by the sound of nails driven into wood this Lenten season. An editorial front page, Bearmage Review, March 26. But we are talking here about 191 American citizens, where in the face of their fine record since December 7th, in the face of their rights of citizenship, in the face of their own relatives being drafted and enlisting in our army, in the face of American decency, is there any excuse for this high-handed evacuation order? Departure Eve, Sunday, March 29th. Three young breasts plume the dark. My mother, her little sister, and their friend Mary. They set out from their safe wing point world, sift through the leafing woods and orchards they know by heart, with my mother at 16 in the lead. They come to an old house in a clearing. The family, including a quiet boy, their schoolmate, stands on the porch to greet those here to say goodbye. Headlights flash up and down the driveway. Hugs and whispers, sometimes tears, come and go. The old grandmother in her rocking chair remains steadfast as a bowsprit. She hands an orange to each visitor, oranges that glow in the starless night, just enough to light the way home for my mother, my aunt, and Mary for the rest of their lives. I heard that story in summer of 1973, my parents and Mary Nelson and her husband were talking about it. And a year ago or so, or maybe more longer, I asked Mary's son, who's my age, or her oldest son, do you, did I dream that story or do you, do you remember it? And he said, no, I, I remember it. He was told the same thing. This is called Concurrence, Monday, March 30th. It's going from the micro to the macro. The cloud covered moon two days short of full. Moonlight cocktail by Glenn Miller and his orchestra tops the billboard charts. Eleanor Roosevelt in her March 30th My Day newspaper column will report a beautiful day after a quiet walk in the woods at Hyde Park. The first mass transport of Jews from France arrives by train at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Life Magazine's March 30th issue is in the mail. Cover story, Shirley Temple grows up. On Bainbridge Island, the Sabbath bells have been quiet for hours. An empty dock waits. Of, of sleepless nights, no count is taken. Well, I'm skipping over a lot here, but the army trucks showed up Monday morning. They took the people to Eagledale Dock. They didn't know their destination. They were marched on board the ferry Colloquin under bayonet guard. Um, crowds showed up to wish them farewell, my mother and grandmother included, but they were kept at a distance so they couldn't communicate with their friends. They were taken by train to California. I should backtrack. Up in the wheelhouse, uh, Captain Wyatt wept for his friends down below. They were taken on a shuttered train to California and then bus to Manzanar in the high desert country of central California. Um, and they reached there April 1st. Uh, tar paper shacks and barbed wire and uh, beastly climate winter or summer, and guard towers where the machine guns pointed in. The Woodwards hired some of the kids in the camp to send back dispatches, news dispatches that would be printed in the review to let people know what was going on, births and marriages and deaths and, and softball league scores. But more than that, it was to hold the gate open for their return which he knew would be an issue. 
as it was up and down the West Coast. At the Bainbridge High School graduation ceremonies that late spring, there were 13 empty chairs. Resistance. The fortunes of war, when they pivoted, brought talk of the Nikkei's return. Most letter writers to the review wanted them back. Not all. A man with a crackpot economics book to his name, quote, we knew them as neighbors, wrote the no return leader, as the smiling and inscrutable operators of truck farms and grocery stores. Then came his raw racism, those excremental words ready and waiting in unlit cellars. Then came the public meetings, the first attended by 200. Applause erupted when one claimed Indian reservations a fit precedent for sending their neighbors off. But the ec economics author cautioned his allies against boycotting advertisers in the review. The review must be kept in business, he said. Otherwise, who will print our letters to the editor? The gods of free speech could only blink. I met this man once. He was kind of a legend on the island. For me, he was like Boo Radley. I never laid eyes on him. He had a compound in a forest at the head of a cove on the east side of Bainbridge. It's a long story how it happened, but he took me into his inner sanctum in the summer of 1977. And we sat down and he showed me all kinds of stuff. He was a brilliant, charming, handsome, white-haired old man. He could have been Ezra Pound's brother. And he gave me his book, Think Fast America, published, self-published 1940. The book that will change the world. 50 cents mailed anywhere. Here's the opening line. The finest men who ever lived were tribal savages. And the end comes 367 pages later. And I was thinking about that because he was living out some strange Teutonic deep forest myth and it's popping up in the internet all over that kind of ideology like toadstools in the dark corners. So if it ever went away, it's, it's back. Return, no return. Release came. Fewer Japanese Americans returned to the Northwest and California homes than those from Bainbridge. Mob violence broke out in Hood River, Oregon. Seattle Teamsters prevented Japanese American produce from reaching public markets. Assorted West Coast newspapers whipped up no return froth. Houses left vacant stood vandalized, their fields overgrown. Far fewer no return voices were raised on Bainbridge. On Bainbridge, there were those who had cared for abandoned houses, possessions, and fields. The review had done its job. The review had kept neighbors in touch through the long dark night. The no returners, fists shoved in pockets, got on with life. The watched over fields fruited again. the last piece I'm going to read. Um, it concerns the 60th anniversary of uh, their being sent away. And uh, so this was 2002. I attended and took notes, not knowing if I would be able to make use of it someday, but um, obviously I did. So this is what this is what it was like to be there. Today, on the Eagledale side of Eagle Harbor, a memorial wall commemorates the forced removal <clears throat> of 227 Japanese American men, women, and children, <clears throat> excuse me, in the place where they boarded the ferry Colocan for Seattle. The dock is gone. On the 60th anniversary of that day, March 30th, 2002, a cloudy Saturday morning, some 500 people gathered on the site of the future wall, then in the planning stages to remember. The touchstone for the proceedings, let it not happen again. The crowd stood while two dozen or so Nikkei 
camp, camp veterans, mostly gray haired, shoulders bent by the years, sat on folding chairs down front and listened with the patience associated with Japanese culture. A few got up to speak softly with restraint. One man, a dentist and young child then, was a little more demonstrative. Down this road, we walked in shock. We didn't know where we were going. A visiting pastor spoke of the soul's brokenness as if the soul were a limb. We are here to remember, he said. Politicians had their say. One recalled Lincoln eyeballing the other. I don't like that man. I'll have to get to know him better. Washington's governor of Chinese ancestry said, I don't like the word internment. It was imprisonment. Heartfelt words were daylighted that morning, and yet they couldn't quite touch the unsunned wells of our lives. Official proceedings have their limits. So does language. Near the end, though, something changed. A tall, dignified man in his mid-70s spoke, an island old-timer of Scandinavian descent who served in the Pacific during the war. <clears throat> he started off telling funny stories about his Japanese-American high school pals. That got the crowd laughing. Then he shifted to March 30th, 1942, and started to remember how it was in the place where we now stood. His voice began to flutter like a wounded dove and shut down and he wept. And the crowd heads lowered, as did the heads of the Japanese Americans sitting down front. As he struggled to regain himself, heads stayed down. The small waves behind him broke quietly on the mud flats. A robin caroled high in a fur. The choked silence lasted longer than was comfortable. This was sufficient. At the end, a dignitary pulled the covering off a large rock where the head of the old dock stood. Its plaque tells the story of March 30th, 1942. As the sun broke through, the crowd sang, America the Beautiful. And if you ever are on Bainbridge Island, I would um, urge you to visit the site. It's understated and peaceful and serene and fitting. And thank you for listening. So, yes, this book has pieces, and they kind of speak to a lot of the intersections that I've been, I would say, working on, listening to, you know, trying to receive. So, I've been a, you know, genocide and forgiveness researcher for about 25 years. So, visited a lot of different sites around the world that are uh, commemorative sites and, and that are sites that are dedicated to an understanding of what, what is um, forgiveness have to say to ultimate violence, you know, and there's no real, you know, uh, direct one, two, three answers to that for sure. But there's all kinds of fascinating, gorgeous, you know, movements. And, you know, one of those for just to give an example would be the Nez Perce, you know, in our somewhat our regional area. And one of my close friends, Robbie Paul, who I had the blessing of chairing her dissertation. Her dissertation, she's an Nesperce Nes Nes woman that's one of their leaders, was on five generations of Nesperce leaders from first white contact on up through Chief Joseph, which is associated, united with you know, her clan in, in, in the Nesperce nation all the way up to today. And kind of this concept of you know, what does forgiveness mean in the context of ultimate violence again? And so one of the things that they practice as a nation is they, you know, basically hold a ceremony every year at the site of the Big Hole Massacre. And the Big Hole Massacre occurred in, you know, southwest Montana. And, you know, like the multiple, you know, many massacres throughout the West, uh, especially during the Indian Wars and before and after those, um, you know, elders and children and women were desecrated, killed, you know. And so that's just one of the pieces of the Nez Perce journey. And anyway, there, what they do the, today is they invite the descendants of those who did the massacring to gather with the descendants of those who were massacred. 
and they walk together in the darkness before dawn carrying lanterns and then they come into a peace and reconciliation and forgiveness circle as the dawn is rising and they commemorate the the memory um, so it's, it's these kinds of things that have sort of fascinated me throughout the years i lived on the cheyenne reservation for a number of years as a young person and my dad was a principal and a basketball coach and we were kind of going different places he coached on the crow reservation and then a lot of contacts also on the Blackfoot Reservation. And that said, there's certainly the American history or the American shadow of atrocity that rises from dominant culture. Um, and, and I think we would all recognize there is that shadow in all of us throughout the history of our ethnicities, basically. So in my own personal life, and an interesting turn on that, um, Germany, my background is mostly German American and Czech American. And, you know, during World War II, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia and some of the atrocities and the genocidal tendencies of Reinhard Heydrich, who was installed by Hitler, you know, in what's called Rodschen Castle, kind of the thousand year castle where the leaders of Czechoslovakia have, have been right um, on up to today, too. But, you know, he installed Hitler installed Reinhard Heydrich, who was called the Blonde Beast and the Butcher of Prague for his you know genocidal ways. Um, you know, that, that context, one of the major massacres was at Ladice. And what happened in the wake of World War II was the leaders of Ladice then, you know, eventually wanted to commemorate the site and, and, you know, draw people into a conversation around forgiveness. And so in that case, they built what's called the Garden of uh, Peace and Friendship. And they asked the children of, you know, the children of um, Czechoslovakia asked the children of Germany to plant these this rose garden of 100,000 roses that came from, you know, over 53 countries from around the world. Right? So it's sort of this, this movement that is asking questions that are in a way unanswerable, but in a way also inviolable, you know, like, you know, they, they reside in us profoundly. So this book has all kinds of stuff in it, basketball on the reservation and, you know, father, father, son relationship and all this different stuff on poetry and, you know, forgiveness and, um, you know, these questions around our interpersonal one-on-one -on -one all the way up to genocidal violence. But so I'll just read a couple of pieces for, for now. So this one is called Hunger and it has three sections. I won't read all the sections, but this one is sort of getting back to some of my Montana roots. Okay. Hunger. At night from the rims above Billings, Montana, stars pattern the vault over the Beartooth Range. The Yellowstone River roils unseen in the darkness and the sky is dusted white by the Milky Way, turning a slow wheel. Lucky enough to get there early with my father at sunset, a blood red line on the edge of the world parted the horizon under a granite swath of cloud. The sky lit from above, light blue, becoming violet, becoming black. Hunger in the land and sky. Then nightfall, and him and I seated on Rimrock looking south toward the star fields over the Beartooths. In my mind's eye, I'm a boy again, and in the dark, he's calling me toward something I can't, I can't see. I'm going to Sylvan Lake tomorrow, he says. You want to go with me? I didn't want to go. I knew it was a five-mile hike up switchbacks as steep as teeth, but my father persuaded me. We were a fishing family, as comfortable with fly rods as we were with handshakes. Fishing put food on the table. This was one of the first times I remember noticing I was hungry for something other than food. I couldn't put a name to it, but that hunger was a thorn more piercing than physical hunger. Growing up, the feeling grew, and I felt it equally in the trailer houses we lived in. On the hardwood, my brother and I flew over on our way to collegiate and professional basketball. In the rivers, we body floated under white August suns, and atop the mountain passes our father led us through. I felt it on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Southeast Montana, where I spent part of my childhood, and at the mouth of Paradise Valley, just outside Livingston, where I went to high school. I felt it fishing, I felt it hunting. That hunger began to permeate my life. When my father mentioned Sylvan as a boy, I wanted to avoid pain. He woke me at 4 a.m., night dark dreams, his quiet voice, you ready? Time to get up now. Bright light over the kitchen table. We poured cereal into thin white bowls. He'd flirted with alcohol, attempted divorce, drank more, fought in bars, divorced my mother for a crow woman in Plenty Coup, south of Billings, fled the family. 
felt broken by the loss of his sons, left the crow woman, remarried my mother. He leaned over his cereal, ate his toast, opened his Bible as if splitting wood. He read from Proverbs. For many years, young and old, I'd hated him. The hunger remained unspoken in him and in me. Hunger can make us more alive. <clears throat> Legend has it the poet and novelist Jim Harrison loved to fish almost as much as he loved women, but not quite as much as he loved eating. But I'd say it wasn't hedonism that made him one of America's most recognized voices. It was hunger. Harrison, poorer than he wanted to admit, largely unknown and with limited prospects, had a friend from college days named Tom McGuane. McGuane found early fame with novels like The Sporting Club, The Bushwhacked Piano, and 92 in the Shade, as well as the screenwriting credits for Rancho Deluxe and The Missouri Breaks. With McGuane's widening Hollywood connections, he introduced Harrison to Jack Nicholson. Nicholson asked Harrison to send him something, but Harrison, being unruly and untrusting of Hollywood, didn't. A few years later, their paths crossed again. Why didn't you send me something, Nicholas asked. Because, said Harrison, people, people talk, but nothing happens. People like yanking people's chains. Nicholson dug deeper. How much debt are you in? 16,000, Harrison replied. And how much would it take for you to be able to write for a year and not worry about money? 16,000, Harrison said again. On the spot, Nicholson wrote him a check for 32,000. Harrison went home. Okay, just a sec. Harrison went home and wrote Legends of the Fall in nine days. The entire novella appeared in Esquire magazine, later becoming one of the nation's most iconic films, starring Anthony Hopkins, Aidan Quinn, Tantu Cardinal, Julie Ormond, and a young Brad Pitt. Hunger makes us crazy. Hunger makes us sane. At Sylvan Lake, from the trailhead to the first incline is easy. From there, it's a sheer grind to the top. We toted our fly rods and dented aluminum tubes, inside us a feeling of light restlessness, hope, and hunger. I was 14, he was 40. When we stopped, we leaned into the rock and drank water, admiring the beauty below, then kept on. Water quiets hunger, but never quite overcomes the hollowness. Hunger is existence, physicality, affection, and the distance between fathers and sons. Climbing mountains to find fish, hunger can also be spiritual hunger. As love grows within you, so beauty grows, the ancients said. For love is the beauty of the soul. We rose through mature lodgepole, lodgepole pines, flared at times by stands of aspen, until we left trees behind and moved through switchbacks carved from the mountain wall. Southern Lake is a gem more than 9,000 feet high, holding uncommonly California golden trout. Stocked in 1938, the fish in Sylvan remains so genetically pure, Montana's fish and game still gathers the eggs to stock other lakes. The granite faces of Sylvan Peak ascend another 3,000 feet above the water. The first four miles climbing, the gain is so precipitous, I start to loathe wilderness, despite my best intentions. My father is pleasant all the way, not to spite me, but because he's always taken delight in moving steadily into the sky, a thing common to him nearly his whole life in Montana. A few hours in, we rest again. Far below, we see East Rosebud Lake, the Phantom Creek drainage, and far off the hard span of froze to death plateau. A barrenness covered in snow and ice 11 months of the year where winter winds blow spin drift and at hurricane speeds. Today is a blue sky day, the sun high and hot. Arctic gentian blooms mingle with lichen and tough grasses. Crow Lake remains unseen from here, as does the West Rosebud Valley and Mystic Lake with its long, difficult to navigate rock field. The valleys are full of hidden treasures, Huckleberry Lake, Silver Lake, Snow Lakes, Princess Lake, and Avalanche Lake, the West Boulder Drainage and Island Lake, none of which demand quite the incline Sylvan demands. We walk in country that boasts Tempest Mountain, Mystic Mountain, and Granite Peak. These and hundreds more shoulder the Beartooth Range. In the end, to cut time, my father moves us off trail to, to traverse the edge wash of a shale ascent where we grab at rock and root and scramble on all fours for a few hundred yards until we top the lip of the bowl. There we stand staring down at the bright blue of Sylvan set in the, in the crater. We find sparse trees and hardy scrub brush in the granite swales of the mountain. Sylvan is positioned at the apex of the hell roaring creek drainage. The hunger is alive in us now, in our bodies, and in all we see. 
The descent from lip to lake is steep, but within the hour we stand near one another, setting our lines on the air. Schools of goldens visible below the lake's surface in a great clarity of water and light. Let me just look at our time. Okay, we're good. An elk's skull whitened by sun, flesh and hide eaten away by maggots. A rack high and wide spiked, wing-like from the skull plate. A horn base thicker than a man's wrist. Ivory teeth on a formica tabletop. If you carry the skull and horns of a bull elk, lifting it by the base of one horn, the bark and heft feel good in the hand, like driftwood, but with a heavier core. After a life of mountains and rivers, my hands, like my father's, are meant to carry wild things. A fish feels like quicksilver, cold, elusive. Montana, land of mountain ranges, the Beartooths, the Crazies, the Bridgers, the Spanish Peaks and the Missions, the Sapphires and the Bear's Paws. Hunting like hunger is visceral. We cleaned animals in the field, always for hunger, also for pride. We used a long, narrow hunting knife and a sharpening tool made of metal shaped like a pencil. We split the animal from pelvic crown to neckline and peeled the hide from the body hot. We removed all the edibles using the rectangular bone saw to remove the quarters. We sawed the head from the spine. If the animal was big, we kept the skull and cape for taxidermy. Our hands were steeped in blood. To curb hunger, we hunted as much as we fished. Fishing like hunting was sustenance, just more fluid and refined. Hunting was violent. Fishing was lightning slicked with water. Dangerous at times, but rarely so. The Yellowstone tried to kill me twice, but no doubt the death would have been declared human error. On another occasion, our bird dog, a high-strung Brittany, was swept into rapids. Flailing, she disappeared a mile downstream, but eventually came back, her tail between her legs. Fishing meant walking the river in jeans and tennis shoes, moving out shirtless into the pooling water below rock. Leaning back into the flow, my father and I made casts that felt like perfection in a world of imperfect things. We cooked elk and rainbow in a cast iron skillet. We ate quietly in the evening light of the trailer. People often ask me what it was like living on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Scary in the beginning, but very good in the end, I say. Leif Haugen still close, Russell Tall White Man. Cleveland the Mint, Blake Walks Nice, murdered behind Jimtown Bar. My brothers, they gave me life. Trace my family a generation or two and find alcohol in excess, bar fighting, jail time, poverty. Also find love and wilderness. The concentrated amount of that love came from being loved by Northern Cheyenne people. Unknown to me as a boy, the history of the Cheyenne is fraught with genocide. Flying a white flag of peace along with an American flag under cheap black kettle. The Cheyenne were massacred at Sand Creek in 1864 by Colonel John Chivington. Chivington and his militia killed women, children, and elders in one of the ugliest engagements in U.S. history, mutilating the bodies, cutting off private parts, and later parading them on stage at the Apollo Theater in Denver, along with fetuses and 100 pubic scalps. Chivington, a Methodist deacon, was never brought to justice. The hunger that lies in the shadow of loss is irrevocable. My family was given more grace than we deserved on the Cheyenne Reservation, a line of grace that remains unbroken. Before I was born, when my father ran with Cleveland Highwalker, also Cheyenne, after my dad had made that trade of deer and magpie for moccasins, after Cleveland's grandmother had dried the skins and chewed the leather to soften it, then sewed precise stitches and set her immaculate beating into the surface, my dad knew love. It is said love is the affinity which draws together the whole world. My dad's eyes are still haunted. He keeps those moccasins like a talisman, a touchstone. Hunger is mortality, brotherhood, despair. Hunger is hope. So that's kind of the first section of that three, you know, triptych essay that's kind of looking at hunger and what happens in our lives. So um, I want to kind of pair that up with a beloved poet, uh, Joy Harjo, the first uh, poet laureate of America that is native of Native Nations. And then we'll go to any thoughts or questions you have. So let's just listen and kind of, you know, let ourselves come down into Joy Harjo's voice. This is from She Had Some Horses. She had some horses. She had horses who were bodies of sand. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. She had horses who were skins of ocean water. She had horses who were the blue air of sky. She had horses who were fur and teeth. She had horses who were clay and would break. She had horses who were splintered red cliff. 
she had some horses. She had horses with eyes of trains. She had horses with full brown thighs. She had horses who laughed too much. She had horses who threw rocks at glass houses. She had horses who licked razor blades. She had some horses. She had horses who danced in their mother's arms. She had horses who thought they were the sun and their bodies shone and burned like stars. She had horses who waltzed nightly on the moon. She had horses who were much too shy and kept quiet in stalls of their own making. She had some horses. She had horses who got down on their knees for any savior. She had horses who thought their high price had saved them. She had horses who tried to save her, who climbed in her bed at night and prayed. She had some horses. She had some horses she loved. She had some horses she hated. These were the same horses. So, Joy Harjo. All right, back to that original story of Germany and Czechoslovakia. My German grandmother, Catherine, married, or my, yeah, my Czech grandmother, Catherine, who we called the great one and who was deeply loved by everyone. Um, she was a dancer and a postmaster out there on the high plains of Montana. Um, she married my German grandfather, Herbert, in New York City uh, during World War II after Germany had invaded Czechoslovakia. And we still look to them as the essence of how to be together. So 